Um, ladies and gentlemen, take your seats. Um, we are going to start with uh, this uh, session on renewable energy and climate. Um, so it's I'm Thierry Ranchin. I'm uh, um, working on this domain since uh, some years. And so the scope is really to showcase the use of Earth's observation for renewable energy and climate application. So you will see that this year we will uh, more focus on solar energy, but uh, also on some other topics about climate. And uh, and uh, and we will discuss some presentation about uh, the renewable energy application on, on based on Earth's observation, some example, of course. And we will describe also the current evolution of the Copernicus Energy Hub, thanks to uh, Fabio. And we will have an open discussion on, uh, on, on the different topics linked with uh, Eurogeo. So here is the program for, uh, for the next hour and a half we have in front of us. And so uh, I would like to, uh, to give the floor now to Stelios Kazacit, which is online. Uh, Stelios, I think the floor is yours. So uh, we'll stop sharing the program and see uh, the presentation from Stelios. Let's go. Okay. Uh, hello, Terry. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm sorry I cannot be there today, but uh, there were some problems tomorrow, early in the morning, so it was difficult to. Terry, if, if you can speak louder. <coughs> and also, you are. You are Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, speak. From the Zoom, it's okay. I don't know from from the uh, from the from the room. I don't know. Okay. Uh, if you can hear them or can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, can you hear me now? Is it better and can you see my screen? So uh, we you have to switch the mode for us. At the top, at the top. Display settings. Change that. So you have to change on the display setting. Okay, or you can stay with that and uh, and go with uh, the usual mode of uh, of PowerPoint. Up to you. Not sure that is Stelios. Can you hear us? Yes, yes. And uh, do you hear uh, Thierry as well? Yes, yes. Now. Uh, ah, okay. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to present uh, uh, this first presentation. I'm Stelios Kazazis. I work in the World Distance Center in Switzerland. And this presentation is uh, together with uh, Harsh and all the people that work towards this uh, Next Sense application in the research projects. The collaboration with the National Observatory of Athens, the Armin Paris Tech, and also Transvalor from France. Uh, the main uh, motivation about this application has to do with uh, uh, the global and international initiative for mitigation of climate change, and uh, the more specific of the uh, let's say the uh, initiatives that the ESA project uh, has uh, uh, wanted to, part, to to have application to to include, and these are the UN uh, agenda for sustainable development, more specific the goal seven for affordable and clean energy. And the sub uh, sections about the reliable and energy services, and also the increasing the share in the renewable mix, and the directives uh, and uh, agreements uh, like the Paris Agreement, the Repower Europe, and uh, 
in addition to some initiatives that are linked with the ACF project, the Geo Initiative for uh, the Vision for Energy and the Geo Cradle Initiative from Eurogeo. All this about uh, has to do also with the evolution of the renewable energy targets from 22% in uh, 2009 up to 45% in 2022 with the uh, goal to reach this uh, percentage in 2030. And uh, in order to do that, the, the problem here is the, that the increase of demand for solar energy needs more efficient production and integration to the electricity grid. So also to try to minimize the cost of civil installation infrastructure. So the motivation was to find some fast and accurate high special and tempor high temporary resolution energy forecast that can contribute to significant towards this goal. And uh, from the science- Thelios, can you hear yeah. me? We, we don't hear you. Can you push your, your, the volume of your mic at the maximum, please? Uh, or, or speak louder because it's it's really difficult from the room to uh, hear you is this better or the same not that much yeah where is your microphone where is your mic the mic is in the computer so uh Okay, I will try to speak uh, something like that. Is it okay? Can you hear me? <clears throat> can you hear me? On Zoom, we can hear you. I don't know if... From the room, Thierry. From the room, it's 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 a bit uh, soft. So if you can not shout, but uh, speak as loud as you can, Celios. Okay. So. Uh, Good. So the the most the scientific problem is to in order to have some more accurate now casting or forecasting of solar energy, is. Uh, uh, for different time scales, you need to know to understand the atmospheric conditions and mostly clouds and aerosols. And this was the scientific challenge for this application. And the last point is that uh, it's important to try to utilize this European uh, Earth observation resources, especially Copernicus related. I will talk more about it and provide this uh, innovation, innov innovative and mature products. Uh, now, a little bit about the system. The system uh, works with inputs from different sources. One is the Copernicus Atmospheric Monitoring Service, and I'm talking about the now casting system now. The second one is uh, data from climatologists and other data, aerosol data from the Sentinel satellite. And the last one is uh, the, the cloud product of the MSD instrument in the UMET, it's a UMETSAT product. Uh, so this uh, uh, now casting system has a feature of uh, pre-run uh, uh, seven-dimension uh, radiative transfer model, and also uh, it has a, a new, let's say, parameterization of the cloud uh, cloud optics. Uh, and the output of this system is uh, global horizontal irradiance and directional irradiance at all sky conditions in real time every 15 minutes that this cloud image is coming, and also spectral uh, data from 300 up to 3,000 nanometers for Europe, Middle East, and North Africa. Uh, this system has been uh, evaluated through in some uh, publications and uh, using ground-based data from the baseline surface radiation network with quite uh, nice results from different kinds of uh, uh, places and conditions. And then uh, during the last year of the ESA project, this, uh, uh, this uh, application has been upgraded to also to, uh, to the for certain forecasting system, which forecasts the solar radiation in the next uh, from zero up to four hours. So in order to do that, there was a new, uh, let's say, module, a cloud motion vector module that was 
uh, in addition to the previous uh, now casting system. And now using this forecasting for clouds, if you can uh, uh, estimate the solar radiation uh, for the next few hours. Uh, this uh, whole application is now in this uh, kind of site that you can scan. This is application for the short term forecasting uh, aspect. You can see that clicking some, this is a picture from last week, 29th of September, clicking in, in any point here, you can see a box of five by five kilometers. And then immediately you can see how much is the solar radiation now, how much it will be in the next three hours and how much it has been in the past few hours. And this is the point here in Italy that some clouds are approaching. So even if there was a very nice day till then, then you expect some kind of uh, uh, less solar radiation in this area. Uh, then, uh, in terms of users, uh, this was uh, this this was developed in order to have the transmission and the distribution operators for national or private uh, uh, developments and plants. And uh, the expected user community it uh, has to do with grid operators, uh, power and electricity corporation, ministries, energy trading, researchers, and also down to the uh, uh, let's say building level. Uh, the supporting infrastructure to do this is the GeoCradle and Beyond uh, at the National Observatory of Athens collaborative ground segment for satellite data and also uh, computer infrastructure. And as I said, the partners, in addition to the World Radiation Center and the National Observatory of Athens, was Sarmin and Frank Valor. Uh, now, this uh, uh, next sense, in addition to what I already said, has different kind of aspects. It uses past data for various databases or databases that extract from itself, from the past, uh, in order to explore uh, and define solar potential for specific areas, uh, now casting and short term forecasting, as I described. Also, long term forecasting using numerical weather prediction models uh, for the next one to two days. And in the end, the spectral data can be used for health applications like UV index, DNA damage, and vitamin D. And uh, this is for the UV region. And for the visible region, it's uh, photosynthetically active radiation for agriculture. Uh, if I go through a little bit fast one by one, the first one about past exploitation has been used uh, with users from the Ministry of uh, Renewable Energy and Electricity in Egypt, the actual ministry that asked uh, for the solar atlas of Egypt and asked also the characterization of some national areas in order to build uh, photovoltaic parks in addition to uh, Park Foundation Center in Aswan. Uh, then uh, the now casting project was used uh, in different aspects. One was this uh, application for Cyprus due within one uh, European project, Excelsior, to understand the global horizontal and DNI uh, radiation for Cyprus. Also, it was analyzed in an economical kind of sense for this Mati Yakub Hart Foundation in Aswan in terms of the effect of dust aerosols for the area and the effect, the economic effects uh, on, uh, uh, on, the, on, on the potential photovoltaic park there. And uh, the third one was some publications related to the use of another geostationary satellite that focuses on the Indian Ocean. So there was an analysis for, the, for India. Uh, then for the certain forecasting, there was the Greek national power transmission operator uh, called the IPTO. And also the power, public power corporation renewables, which is a, a SME based on the public power corporation of Greece that uh, have used uh, during the ECA project this uh, this application. Now uh, for the long term forecasting, uh, there is also in the same uh, site that I showed, I showed you before. There is an application for uh, the Greek area. This was used again for the public power corporation. And you can see here that uh, clicking in real time in some of the major cities in Greece and some of the major photovoltaic, uh, let's say, parks, uh, especially national parks, you can see what's going on, what's going on today and the next uh, two days uh, for this area in terms of uh, solar energy. Uh, again, for the UV, uh, so using the spectral data, 
there was this application that was used from the uh, some uh, ferries uh, during the vacation time, during summertime in Greece. And again, the application, the same web page uh, deals with clicking at some major cities in Greece. And you can see the forecast for the next two days view index for this uh, city. Uh, some uh, the way forward, let's say. Uh, uh, about science, cloud and aerosol forecast improvements have to be implemented in general based on this triangle of model satellite as observation and city data. There is now this destination Earth EU initiative with uh, a lot of data, homogenized data going together as a human and ECMWF data lakes, as they are called. Uh, so this is a digital innovation file, in, file important uh, potential for solar and wind applications. There are user, about user-oriented applications, uh, a very important aspect is site adaptation. So you can use this kind of models, but if you are focusing on one specific area, someone can also build on using in situ measurement, historical data, artificial intelligence techniques, also probabilistic methods in order to improve this model in a, a kind of very user-oriented area. And then uh, of course, there's always scientifically the trade-off between scaling up uh, an application and uh, the model accuracy. So the model adaptation to the infrastructure scale can also uh, help improve accuracy. Another important aspect about the users is to try to demonstrate and convince the stakeholders that the importance of uh, the model accuracy where a few percent of improvements can equal a high profits for this multi-billion renewable, uh, let's say, future. Now for Euro Geo and Renewable Energy Strategy, there is this Geo Venner and also this Geo Credit Initiative that, uh, I, I, well, we have discussed that they need some kind of reorganization and this energy action group towards some very targeted, let's say, action in order to define some roadmap uh, for the sustainability of all these applications that uh, were uh, developed through this CSA project and to design some future joint actions. And all this trying to address various uh, aspects of the Green Deal, the European Institute of Green Deal, Euro European uh, Union Energy legislation, legislations, and agreements, uh, including the United Nations standard uh, SDG goals for clean energy. Thank you very much, and sorry about the technical problems. Thanks a lot, uh, Stelios. Any burning question on the room? Or we, uh, we can have the series of questions at the end? and we'll have a discussion there. Okay, so thanks a lot. Uh, Stelio, stay with us. And uh, Philippe, I think the floor is yours. Thank you, Thierry. Up. I'm sharing the screen. You should see something already. And I can... Okay, so... Do you see my screen? Yes, it's okay. And you hear me? Okay, so um, hello everyone. My name is Philippe Blanc. It's a pleasure for me for doing this presentation. Thank you for the organization and the invitation. So um, I will talk about high photovoltaic penetration at urban scale. Um, and it's uh, it can be seen, and it has been developed in the same framework of the ISHA project as Stelios, and can be seen as the same. We are sharing the same solar resource um, uh, needs, uh, but at a different scale, at a um, finer scale, uh, which corresponds to do the urban scale. So I won't go into details about the context. We it has been already introduced by Stelios and. More specifically for the urban scale, we can mention that there is the European, European Solar Rooftop Initiative, which is part of the 
Solar Energy Strategy of the Europe and Repower EU, of course. And the idea is to push uh, and to accelerate the PV rooftop installation uh, with a series of measures um, that limits the length uh, uh, of the, the time. And the idea is that the potential of 25% of the EU electricity consumption um, uh, from the solar rooftops, which makes sense. Okay, wh why it makes sense? Because um, in urban area, it's very interesting to have these PV systems, no emission of pollutants, no direct emission of pollutants of greenhouse gas during the exploitation of the PV system. The production of electricity is done exactly where the electricity is consumed, and it corresponds to more than 70% of the population of Europe in uh, cities. And it, um, can, it can add value to unused urban roof, um, uh, parking sheds for com commercial centers, etc. So having a better understanding uh, of the solar resource, its variability and solar cadaster in space and in time, we will see, provide uh, information to uh, that enable to analyze the solar potential of roof and shades over, uh, over city compared to the local electricity consumption, and it helps public and private decision makers and investors. So solar cadaster is not, is not new. And uh, for example, we took part of, uh, of the first solar cadaster in France, at least in 2016. And it uh, provides free, accurate, and easy to use tool for general public to assess the solar potential or rooftops PV systems. So it has been done with the French National Mapping Agency, IGN, Min Paris, and Soda Transvalor Innovation at the time. So it was uh, uh, solar mapping at high resolution, but computed once and for all only for the for the the roof, so corresponding to the buildings. Uh, and um, uh, only at an annual uh, basis for the solar radiation. So in the E-Shape project, um, we had pilots dedicated to high PVP inflation at urban scale. And uh, the objective was to provide GIS tools dedicated to uh, high PVP inflation um, based on Earth observation for, two, in fact, two two parts of the pilot, and one was, it will be presented by Marion afterwards. The part one was about the PV variability at urban scale. It was the pilot, it, 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 it is about Earth's observation data to have a better modeling of the uh, urban energy system dedicated to PV integration. Okay, so our vision during this uh, project is to go from uh, static solar cadaster, we used to, and we developed the algorithm for that, to dynamic solar assessment and forecasting at urban scale, dedicated to urban scale, but on the fly, using Earth observation. So it's not anymore pre-computed solar map at high resolution, only giving a multi-year yearly or monthly uh, yields, but the idea is to compute on the fly over a zone of interest that is free to select. It can be a rule, but it's open to other places uh, and uh, to promote and support PV penetration cities. And uh, the fact is that it provides not only maps, but time resolved maps, intraday up to 15 minutes resolution with a special resolution of lower than one meter. And the basic of the, the basic idea of this uh, dynamic uh, solar assessment and forecasting is to be based on the, uh, on the cloud and to have a, as a service solar assessment and forecasting. So cloud-based, on-demand, on demand, on the fly, scalable. So if you want to have, uh, you can, you can um, invoke uh, different servers to have uh, the um, requested amount of power computing to provide the service. And it's input agnostic because everything is based on interoperable and uh, open uh, interoperable system with uh, standards. 
of web processing services. So we can manage to use a different source of information from and uh, this type of information. And the idea is provided that this information can be delivered in the same way as uh, interoperability and uh, uh, is a request, then we can use this information to provide the service at your band scale. So what are the Earth observation data? So first, we uh, basically, we are using uh, CAMS, Copernicus Atmospheric Monitoring Services, uh, dedicated to radiation. So it's based on Heliosat 4 methods uh, developed by DLR, FMI, and MinPari, and also uh, um, uh, images from Metosat second generation. So we are also providing information about the clear sky state of the atmosphere, integrating aerosol uh, and water vapor. Uh, and you can see here an example of dust events uh, that went through the France. And you can see the effect of this dust event. It's not cloud, it's, it's aerosol. And this is uh, um, accounted by uh, the model. And it's very important for cities uh, at certain scale. We are limited by the scale from CAMS radiation, from CAM, as CAMS aerosol, sorry. But it, you can have some information, and we have demonstrated that in some places, it makes sense to use this aerosol data in city to provide this variability induced by aerosol. And if it's possible uh, and available, we can use in situ pyranometric measurements to do the calibration for the long term series of satellite data. We are using also um, digital elevation models. So, for example, from SRTM, but also DSM, digital, digital surface model, standardly provided by uh, airborne system uh, with orthophoto images or um, LIDAR data. And this is an example of, uh, this is the premise of MinPari in Paris. You can see the buildings, you can see the trees, you can see uh, some part of the buildings, the different heights. So you can see the complexity of the shape of the uh, of the urban at the urban scale, and we can compute in a very fast and efficient way the mask that uh, occults that uh, prevents the direct from the direct radiation from the sun to arrive on the given uh, uh, square meter of interest. So uh, from this e shape pilot from which for which we have. Uh, made some developments, uh, cloud developments, um, acceleration, efficiency, etc. Also, some co-design to try to see uh, what would be the end users and how to adapt uh, our, our outputs, uh, our way of pre presenting the data, computing the data for different users. And at the end of the ESHA project, it came, came out, we can think about uh, MinPari PSL spin-off that is under construction. The name is Solar Disrupt. Uh, and the idea is to uh, uh, provide bankable solar data at urban scale as a service. So it provides some features, free selection of area of interest, not only rooftops, parking space, roads, facade, vertical facade as well. Um, Multi-annual time series up to 15 minute time resolution. Uh, and it can be less if you, we uh, interpolate the results. Analysis of PV self-consumption, if you compare this time series of uh, area of interest, you can put a PV system, you can, you can compare term per time uh, with the uh, energy consumption, electric consumption. Analysis of PV fleet injection in the urban electric grid with or without storage, because you have time series, historical data, so you can see uh, the conjunction, uh, the occurrence of conjunction, etc. and so to uh, define the grid for the to ingest to inject to, to be able to, to uh, accept this PV uh, outputs analysis of impact of new buildings so you have a PV system already uh, in place and you have a new building and you can assess the effect the effect of this uh, new building on the PV yields and you can also since it's a uh, you can do some short term forecasting uh, of urban PV fleets for electric spot markets. So you can see here the team uh, that are involved in the possible spin-off Solar Disrupt. You have Nicolas, 
Lionel that is already in the room, and Benoit, uh, Benoit, the com computer science guy, and HNV also uh, uh, for this uh, spin-off. And this is a static solar cadaster that you, you you can see, for example, from Google. You can you can see the shadow at yearly basis here. Uh, yes, no, sorry, it's a daily basis here, but you, you have this type of information. And of course, having the time result information, you get time series for each uh, pixel here. And you can here, see, you have a zoom here, you can see the details um, you can have with this type of computation. And if you put, imagine the PV system uh, at this part of the roof, then you can here have the uh, POA, what we call the plane of array uh, irradiance coming to this place. And then it's rather easy to make a simulation of PV outputs. OK, so you can uh, you can see this uh, the, the, the interest of this. And by the way, this has been computed in, uh, let's say, minutes of time computation with the proper um, uh, server on the cloud as a service. Uh, thank you very much. And maybe there will be some discussion or question afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe. Uh, any burning question? Yes, we have one. Yeah, I was wondering in terms of adoption, I was wondering if there was any plan to convert I mean, the, the maps you have into money, could you aggregate, you know, it's okay, if you put a solar panel based on, because you also have the price of energy in real time, could yeah. you take for one year and have, okay, if you use solar panel for this area, this is how much you would make money? I think this would very help convince yes. people to say, okay, look, this is how much a rooftop is worth for one year. Yes, yes, and you, you're right. The, here we are providing complex outputs, and, uh, and it's the reason why we did some uh, co-designed to derive from uh, valuable information. And indeed, for some application, uh, here it's an example of just irradiance, so it does not talk to everyone. But we have derived some outputs, and more particularly for PV self-consumption. Indeed, you can, for a given place, for one year, you can have a simulation and say, if you have a PV system there, then you will save this amount of money because you can uh, have your own uh, electricity that is, is definitely at lower cost uh, as the one that you, you would import from the grid. And it's, it will be even more and uh, even more contrasted with the time because we all know that the electricity will be um, um, uh, costly uh, and costar and costar. Uh, sorry, I don't the term, but uh, expensive, more expensive with the time. Uh, so we can derive some very um, Money based, if you want, for talking to people. Yes. The the short answer was yes. <laughs> yes. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It was a complete one. Very. Thank you for that. Uh, so, um, I, thank you. And so we are going to the next speaker. Uh, so, Miko. So. But good afternoon, I can say anyway. So if the slides are not up yet. So the Arctic is my topic and how sustainable energy is challenging for the Arctic, but also of course the, the way to go. Um, and this comes from a project from Arctic Passion where there's actually no specific work on, on sustainable energy and some things that we do at the Finnish Metallurgical Institute. Uh, I think very important to understand, especially for the European Arctic, Hydropower, so energy production, is actually one of the main exports of this area to the south. Uh, so there's usually something like fishing for the Norwegians, forestry in Finland, and then uh, tourism in both cases. But the number three in all countries in the Nordics are pretty much that the energy is an export uh, good. And it usually comes from hydropower, some comes from others. Uh, but what is challenging for this is that the it's not anymore so foreseeable as it was before because uh, 
the snow amounts in winters are really changing more than it was usual. So sometimes we have huge amounts of snow, then we have small amounts of so snow, and all of that is something which uh, they try to predict better and better. We have done, and this is something where E-shape is still also shown, so uh, a performer project uh, for Eurogeo, that, uh, that we try to really make that snow power, so how much power potential is in the, in the snow pack, uh, make that a service. Can you, there's this one window, can you move that from my slides away? On the left side. There's this small irritating window, please take it away. Um, anyway, so Jaco Ikona and Jamal Tanis have, have made this hops.fmi.fi service for the biggest uh, hydropower operator in Finland. So they have 21 dams, if I remember correctly, in this one river delta where several rivers flow into one. Kemi River, big one in the end. Kemi Yaki is the company name, so it comes from the big river name. All kinds of parameters are there, but I think the interesting fact is now the yeah uh, seasonal forecasts is I think where it then boils down to what energy business is many times about. The Nordic countries have all um, a Nordic countries all have uh, their. Uh, energy market in one place, so it's it's a it's a bidding and buying uh, stock exchange style work, and and to be really releasing at the right amount your energy is is, is crucial. So they really want to understand for a longer time forward already how it goes. We have had really nice success with machine learning uh, forecast models to be able to do this even for a long period forward. Um, when it comes to this uh, hydropower thing, what is also again something that's because of climate change is a little bit fluctuating more is that we have these ice dams uh, and then the ice situations in in the, um, let's say, river and lake systems uh, in Finland at least are challenging. But even for that, uh, so we just had a, a new graduate thesis uh, st uh, student last year, she made a so Golda Prakasam, she made a, a nice uh, product for us for ice jams. So that when we, in Sentinel-1 images, just check all the pixels for rivers and lakes, we can say where there is ice and where not, and especially we can also distinguish when it's damming, all that ice gets less flat, it's like getting together, that you can find those pixels out of there. Um, but then the lake ice service that our colleagues in Suke are doing, in Arctic Passion, for example, that that's also a, a good, knowledge of this because when there is uh, ice this still is a when can they flow what they do in those hydro dams is a little bit restricted then we go to wind power uh, i think that's the biggest trend in in the nordic countries so sweden and finland are kind of like the hydrogen promise that all the industry will from from and it's a very good thing for climate uh, change kind of mitigation purposes that we will not anymore boil, uh, kind of burn any natural gas or, or let's say other kind of fossil fuels, but we will use hydrogen for the smelters, for all kinds of like hot stuff is needed, uh, that it's actually hydrogen burning and the hydrogen would then be produced by actually clean uh, wind energy. So that's why there's a, quite a boom in Finland. I think they have been doubling the wind power uh, produced in just three years or something. So it's, it's like super rapid. You can, in the Finnish map, the gray points are the newest ones. Uh, the green ones are already in operation. I think you can see that, especially the Arctic regions, which start somewhere. Is there a, so Arctic is, oops. Arctic is somewhere, Rovaniemi, about here is the Arctic Circle. So especially in this area, uh, it's really growing. But I put here the, the Sami culture, like the indigenous peoples area in the picture as, as a yellow one. You see that there's not that much in Finland, but in, Sweden, uh, in Norway especially, they, they are also very active there. And it's difficulty sometimes to, reindeer herding is what they mainly do as a business. Uh, and, and well, it has been shown and they have been in, in court, been liable for it that, that wind parks are kind of keeping the reindeers away. They don't like that. So, so in that sense, 
it hurts some of the economy, but it's so interesting that is even in Norway, they are getting more inland from the, let's say, coastline uh, power production that they have until now. But this is kind of super huge and definitely uh, we have many more times energy production in this area when we are actually using it there. So I think some, some cities it was like three times more produced when they consume themselves, something like this or even more. And I also put a little bit the, Nor the North American um, Arctic in there, very few wind power production sites, but in principle very similar to the, the, let's say, winds and, and things. So there's lots of potential in this one. one particular problem maybe in North America more than in in our part of the Arctic is, is permafrost. So that when frozen ground is a lot underneath on which you would have to build, and nowadays they make so high wind powers, uh, let's say constructs, and they are very heavy. So the risk on permafrost to do it is pretty big. So even if I think those fire plants are mostly 20 years or so, they are not forever. Uh, but even in this time frame, to be able to say something about permafrost is interesting. Arctic Passion has actually a permafrost change detection system, but it's more used for, for in this case, in Longyearbyen, Svalbard, Spitsbergen, uh, where they have the buildings in this Longyearbyen town. Uh, some of that has big changes. You see that housing is those things quite close to it. So, so really, things are changing in this respect and they, they had one culture, um, let's say building, they had to re, like lift it up, put some new kind of like deeper poles in and do how they, they, they did even a cooling system under the house. So they lifted the house, put a cooling system under so that the permafrost under the building keeps, keeps normal. Pretty drastic stuff. But uh, this is something where some progress is in Arctic passion being done that, that we try to find out what can be done and earth observation is a wonderful tool for those. Then specific the image on the bottom shows you that biomass burning is still one of the really important ones and these are just the big power plants. So all the houses usually, so the residential things like log burning or like wood is everywhere used, also in Norway. So this is a very bad picture that they wouldn't do that. But anyway, uh, that biomass burning and, and tree-based energy is actually a super important, um, let's say, factor. And it is pretty much okay, kind of, uh, let's say, climate change-wise, because we have also a very quickly increasing growth of trees in this area. So probably can, at least for a, a looking at this area, can have a positive impact on the climate change as well if you use this type of energy. And it's not just energy, they do all kinds of stuff from the trees nowadays. So the plastics, for example, will be replaced, or can be replaced. They are just a little expen more expensive than fossil films, things at the moment, but I think those things we will have to take on board. And biofuels, so biodiesel, the parts that are being now mixed into the, the, the gasoline that we have in Europe, that comes from these bio factories as well. And we have for a long time now had harvestseasons.com, which tries to not just make that part that the, the material is, is going to help climate change, but we also try to make the environment better with this. So the trafficability of the big machines that harvest forests, we, we do a service for them. Just had a, a poster outside, so seven persons came to look at it. Thank you very much. Um, solar power. You, I knew you would have so much of it. I only have this one small slide and on my last slide actually a little bit. Uh, in the Arctic, snow is a very big thing. Uh, so I think it was over half of production can be lost because snow is going to be on top of those. So some kind of snow removal things are probably needed and it's not necessarily good what they did here on the wall. This one, it just is very clearly less productive. Oops, where did I go? Yeah. Okay, I can find the right one. Now I'm not in control anymore. Yeah, but to continue, so so those kind of on the wall where the snow can't stick, then they are like thirty percent or forty percent less productive in the good times, and well, 
then there's not that long as a winter condition that that it is viable to do it like this. But the Arctic is in that sense for all the renewables in a way still something because residential solutions very much use uh, solar power. It's usually because many places are only used in the summer and then you only have sunshine, so anyway, perfect. Uh, and, and production is the best in the world at that time. Uh, one interesting thing that doesn't work well, or at least analysis shows it to be a little bit bad, that tidal, so both wave, wave and tidal energy is uh, kind of not easy to reach and solution based on that for, for sea area. This is for monitoring networks, if they could use the, the wave energy. Best energy would be in something where the difference between the ice slates uh, moving on the sea and the sea could be somehow used, but that's, that gets very difficult at the moment. And sea ice in general is the problem. For sea ice in Arctic Passion, we have a service where for the ship classes, we already do an analysis where can which sit, so Polar code is something where ships are being set in what kind of ice situation are you allowed to, to mo move. And it's of course useful to both analyze. So that picture is showing where are which class areas. So the red ones is no one can, can go and here are different classes can go. We also have that as forecast systems. But let's go quickly to the conclusion because I think two cool, cool things from machine learning, which I'm very much involved in lately. Um, and it relates to Philip's talk a little, just by weather forecasting information being related to observations that we have done. And so the Finnish energy network is really nice that it pro provides all the data on a very fine grain uh, for, for different production modes in Finland. So we have been just using the past years and all the weather information from all of Finland. The machine learning model immediately beat the Finnish FinGrid, so the operator of the uh, general network uh, of, of for us to forecast how much what kind of production comes out so which we actually have been also turning into the energy prices are very volatile in the Nordic so so this has been used for informing if it's going to be expensive or if you can earn money by consuming I have nowadays also a, a, a deal where I can have minus prices so then I have to put the sauna on and, and, you know, get wild. Yeah, but I think Arctic and, and sustainable energy is actually cool. Thank you. Thank you, Miko. Any burning question? No. So I think the next speaker, Fabio, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Thierry. So, uh, I would like to uh, introduce with this uh, presentation the uh, progress with the uh, Copernicus uh, uh, thematic hub on energy. Uh, so, uh, maybe some of you were here this morning for uh, uh, the session on uh, um, health, uh, and so some slides are, are, are the same, but anyway, the, the, the um, voice was not very good, uh, the connection, so repetita juvent anyway. Uh, so the thematic hubs, uh, uh, the concept of the thematic hubs is to um, provide uh, a, another dimension to the uh, services uh, uh, of Copernicus. So we have the traditional Copernicus services organized around the um, science uh, uh, domains, uh, so climate, uh, atmosphere composition, uh, uh, marine services, and so on. We have the dimension of the national collaborations, which I don't have to discuss here, but it's very interesting because we, as we discussed also in previous days, uh, not all the data are uh, useful for everybody everywhere. You know? So there is this national dimension in terms of policy and, and much more. And then there is the dimension of the application areas. So for instance, a sector like uh, energy or it could be health uh, and others. And uh, so um, 
the thematic hubs have the uh, goal, main goals uh, to uh, provide a single entry point to uh, Copernicus services that provide products and information and services uh, specific for that sector, for a, a specific sector, and they provide the simplified access. And then there are, of course, other, other goals, like, uh, for instance, uh, um, provide the inspiration on uh, uh, integration uh, uh, with, uh, with the different type of data sources. Uh, so the uh, climate change service is uh, in charge of uh, uh, developing and maintaining the energy hub and the atmosphere monitoring service is in charge of the health uh, um, hub. Uh, we uh, try to cover uh, all or many of the aspects of uh, 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 the energy sector from uh, production of renewable and non-renewable energy to transmission distributions, efficiency, consumption emissions and so on, including also energy security aspects. So the idea is that then we get, uh, uh, we, uh, we are in, in, in uh, uh, communication with all the Copernicus services, we try to understand with them what uh, products and services can be useful for a specific sector, in this case energy, but not just Copernicus, actually we, we will connect also to other data sources that are useful, for instance from, uh, um, uh, from, uh, from satellite agencies and also, uh, for instance, CCWF is moving more and more towards open data, so there are, there are data that, that can be integrated from the core uh, products uh, of ECWF and the Horizon Europe uh, um, project. Uh, the uh, users on the on the on the on the other side are uh, some of them are already uh, we already interact with them some we will interact uh, so there are the DG uh, the policy DGs of the European Commission member states uh, international uh, European institution international organization WMO and GEO and private sector and more the idea is then is that Energy Hub uh, connects, uh, let's say, the Copernicus offering, for, provides this single entry point to the Copernicus uh, um, uh, offering to these, uh, to these uh, uh, users. Uh, the concept of the thematic hub has been uh, created by the GDFE and there is a role for the Knowledge Center on Earth Observation to be the uh, link between uh, these uh, services and uh, the uh, policy DGs. And there is also an advisory board uh, that I will uh, talk about uh, in a minute. So uh, by talking with the services and users, uh, this is the first, uh, let's say, a uh, set of uh, uh, products, information from different Copernicus services that we believe uh, are useful for uh, the sector. We started with the climate change uh, uh, service, unsurprisingly, um, also because it already had a, 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 a sectoral information system uh, working. But of course, I, we heard already in previous um, presentation, for instance, the use of uh, the uh, CAMS data, but also emergency service as uh, um, they provide river discharge, for instance, and so on. Um, yeah, uh, the, I talked about the advisory board. So this is the current uh, composition of the advisory board. Uh, and basically, uh, the, their, their, the, um, their, their task is to uh, advise uh, on the uh, promotion of uh, uh, how the thematic hubs can help in the promotion of, of the use of Copernicus services, a connection with the users, and how they can also inform on the evolution of the Copernicus services. Um, this is the current composition, however, that doesn't mean that uh, it's fixed. And in fact, uh, I discussed with the theory already a few days ago and, and yesterday as well, that uh, perhaps uh, there is a, a role for Eurogeo, for instance, in some shape or form to, to contribute uh, to, to this and maybe other organizations as well. Uh, so, the, the idea with these thematic hubs is that we add a layer of intelligence, so we under, try to understand uh, 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 by uh, knowing who the users are, what they want and what they need. And in this case, uh, for instance, we talk about uh, uh, the policy DGs, international organizations, and so what they want to, 
do the, the reasons why they need this data is uh, to support policy need decision making and to plan and develop a, a, a power system and what we can offer is the quality control data we can offer tools applications but also inspiration ways uh, that this data can be um, combined together to provide the services that the user community needs and there is here a case with IRENA, the International Renewable, Renewable Energy Agency, that has developed a global atlas for renewable energy where users can overlay climate data and over uh, population density data and other types of data so um, and that can be uh, help uh, to for various reasons uh, for instance uh, for uh, um, for, uh, for, uh, for feasibility studies in site-specific uh, uh, areas for photovoltaic or, or wind power. Uh, this is uh, the, the way that at the moment the hub appears is, is a website basically with uh, links to resources, a catalog of data and uh, user uh, uh, stories. It's a, it's a beta version, it's, it's under development, uh, really, um, and uh, the, it needs more engagement with, uh, with users. It would be, for instance, very interesting to have additional user stories, successful user stories, to inspire also other users on, on the way to, to combine data and to build applications. And uh, it will have also grow with, uh, with more uh, uh, data sources, the catalog will grow, and uh, also um, with, uh, with uh, 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 yeah, in general, user engagement. And uh, um, it will be launched on the 7th of uh, uh, November at the EU Space Week. And this is all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Fabio. Any burning question? Okay, so Suzanne, the floor is yours and then we will have a bit of time for discussion. Yeah, so I will present the, also again eShape <laughs> and Destiny A uh, use case for, from um, renewable energies in DLR. So, we have two models we are using uh, for these issues. We have on the top um, the FlexiGIS. So you can see on the, on the totally um, right, where's the presenter? Here. Um, here will be the, the Earth observation data included. Here we have um, then some load profiles or standard uh, load profiles. And in the end will be some optimization and we can also see if our input data have an effect on these issues. Um, the second uh, model is Remix. I will come later to it in, in detail. So why we are using these um, two models? We want to support potential users like grid operators, uh, private um, persons, researchers, industry, um, and decision makers in urban planning. So, um, as Philippe already said, we had um, the second part of eShape uh, in cooperation with Mean Paris. So, the first part is our data collection by our um, airborne data set. So, we have some um, night lights, we have some hyperspectral data and some optical data. We post-process them with uh, the colleagues um, from um, Remote Sensing Technology, Technology Institute. In the second part, we use um, the development of um, Thierry and Philippe's group um, and uh, using the time series, what has uh, come out from all this um, post-processing. And this time series, we can um, use inside uh, FlexiGIS to have some optimization output, so we can see how the different types of renewable energy um, be optimized for, for the um, georeference data. So in eShape we implement some um, CAMP radiation uh, data sets. We um, generate from the Airborne data sets uh, digital, <laughs> yeah it's easier, <laughs> um, some uh, digital surface models um, 
So we extract um, the height information and the roof uh, top uh, angles, um, also the building footprints, so the outlines of the buildings, all in 20 centimeter resolution. And additionally, we are using the Korean land cover from our colleagues in uh, Oberpfaffenhofen. Inside um, FlexiGIS, uh, it's used PVLIP. Um, there's the calculation for only one single system at the moment. Um, it's using also ERA5 data. And um, this um, was enhanced with um, some CAMS data. So we uh, combined ERA5 data with the CAMS data. And we are also on the way to have some uh, PV multi location processing um, from the airborne data. Um, but it's still ongoing. Um, as I told you, we have the, the single system at the moment, and um, we're extracting from the airborne data the really um, PV shapes and also um, have the ITOS Sky network. I also will come later to that what we will include now to the same series. And um, for some test rooftops, we have 20, uh, 21 PV systems, what we are used. And we could so, uh, see an impact if we um, enhance the era 5 data with CAMS data. All those is also in a graphical um, um, plugin for, for QGIS. Um, and both, both models you can also download from, from uh, GitHub. So they are now available open source. Um, our results in this topic was um, that we can see an impact of the different type of data sets. So in the, in the left, you see the OSM data sets and you see many gaps inside and uh, the fuller cover um, with current data sets. And you can see that you have some, some um, Overestimation from the from the um, OpenStreetMap data uh, to the the Earth observation data here, uh, and the the simulation was done for the electric demand by uh, standard uh, load profiles. So now I come to the testing the Earth um, use case. Here we are developing um, a demonstrator for climate information used in energy system applications. Um, these uh, data sets from Destiny should be uh, ground-based validated on eye to sky. Um, this will be also a comparison of several mod meteorological data sets we will see later and uh, model sensitive, uh, sensitivities um, on that. Um, as mentioned before, um, tools and method development for climate scenarios uh, in energy system workflows. And we have this uh, cooperation uh, between European grid operators, public author authorities, and stakeholders. So in Destiny Earth um, use case, we are working together with Aarhus University and Univers uh, Renewable Grid Initiative. So now I come to the eye to sky. This is our unique um, all sky imager network. So it's measuring solar irradiance um, by global, diffuse, and uh, direct components. So you can see here on the left is the camera. And then you have some um, diffuse measurement. You have the uh, direct measurement here and some, um, no, <laughs> this is the, Direct measurement, this is the um, diffuse measurement, and this is the uh, global measurement. But don't be such uh, detailed with me because um, this is more or less the work of a colleague. Um, additionally, we are measuring temperature and relative uh, humidity. And this i to sky network is used for cloud monitoring. Uh, so the camera is making each 30 seconds an image. And we can have a special resolution by five by five meter. Our actual processing is on 20 by 20 meter resolution. We can forecast with this in high accuracy um, up to 20 minutes and um, overall time up to two hours. So in the complete right side, you see such an output of some um, generated irradiance map, um, the dark points, is, um, is uh, the 
darker part here in, in violet is um, some clouds and the uh, yellow areas is um, some, let's say, clear. So, and the demonstrator should be the remix model. So we will use at the moment um, existing open source data sets. And um, in this project, the ongoing implementation is um, Destiny Earth data um, to validate the uh, weather forecast models. So um, Remix has different inputs uh, like um, different energy demand or technologies. What is inside the model be combined uh, between heat and power, hydrogen, transport and such issues um, and have some output and optimization uh, for, for hourly system data or in the, in the infrastructure capacity um, expansions. So um, the first results we see here is um, an output from the remix um, compared to the um, pan-European climatic data set. Um, so we have on the left we have the base and we can see for um, the unity, University of Re um, Reading and from Renewable Ninja data sets the difference for um, four um, characteristical weeks. So we can see we have different different energy sources and um, depending on the data set we have an impact on those. So what we can say for, for um, com conclusion. So we need an intensive uh, co-design with the uh, application and library developers. So we need to make a really deep um, adaptation in the, in the Flexigas code. Um, in Flexigas, as I said already, we implemented several EO data. Um, the previous system detection is still ongoing. <laughs> And yeah, we can see in both models, we have some impact of EO data or if you use geophysical data sets. Um, yeah, and the application and data evaluation is still ongoing. And if you need some more detailed information, feel free to contact. That's it. <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Suzanne. So, uh, Miko, if you want to, to join, um, Fabio also, Philippe and, uh, and uh, Stelios, I hope you are still online. So, we have a few minutes for, for discussion. Uh, we run a bit of time uh, and uh, there is a session on, on with poster. But I have, uh, I try to, um, to have a series of questions inspired by your, your different presentation. So, um, as you know, we are in the Eurojo workshop. Uh, so this means that the Eurojo uh, aspect is, is uh, underlining a lot of uh, our, our work. And so, as you know, there is uh, this uh, 3C strategy from uh, Eurojo, which is uh, coordinate, combine and cooperate. And I would like to, your point of view on how we can contribute to this as a, as a group working on the energy and how it, it fits to the, the strategy to support uh, this activity, thanks to the different things you present. So, you, up to you. Yeah. So you have to. Uh, Miko goes. Uh, somehow push. Now it, it's on. Uh, well, very simply. So the Arctic Passion Project. Some of those activities, which were not super directly related, but I think in the Arctic Geos. Uh, is it an application, however it's called, when you go into the geo system? We have already mentioned that we are collaborating with Geo Venair. So in that sense, kind of on the geo level, we, we are doing it. But of course, it would be nice to be a more concrete, maybe also on some actions in Eurogeo. And there I must admit that I, I'm not aware of them, but <laughs> ready to do them. I think that's not at all the issue. Um, so we just need some kind of places and, and things to do for and I, I would say that energy hubs or stuff like this is actually a very good place to kind of like where do we present each other is anyway the, I, I don't like the EU projects every project drive up your website try to make it like fancy and live and then five years and then it's gone uh, very stupid so I think in a way something like the energy hub uh, for, for Copernicus or 
similar things. I, I don't mind necessarily what it is, but it would be actually nice if we try more to combine to a like ongoing service the things that we do in projects and not so much that every project has to even Arctic Passion is a great name, so hey, it, it's like, <laughs> don't want to lose that. But in essence, uh, the, 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 the basic concept, I think, is not so good for, for a long time effect of things. So that's why uh, there's something that I see. Thank you, Miko. Um, online, um, Stelios, you, you underlined some topics on, uh, on your conclusion. Maybe you want to intervene on this, uh, on this point. Uh, we can support the Eurojo uh, uh, strategy through the combined uh, coordinate and cooperate uh, aspects. Uh, you... Yes, I think uh, uh, they uh, gave a very good uh, opportunity to develop and to demonstrate and to co-design these uh, applications. A lot of a lot of very useful applications and. Uh, it would be a pity not to have some kind of coordination towards some Euro Geo specific goal. Otherwise, this application, some of them will survive, some of them will not survive. Uh, yeah, that's my my point. Thank you. So, Philippe, you want to uh, to add something on that? No. <laughs> Please say no. Please say no. So come on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. All moment, I don't know. Okay, Fabio, I think. Uh... Is it who? What is it? <laughs> there is nothing here. It's, it's no, just on. Just... Ah, all right. <laughs> I thought there was a button. Yeah, yeah, it seemed like. Um, uh, I would like to make some very similar uh, remarks as I did this morning at the health uh, session. Uh, that uh, is very good that, that uh, we can have this. Uh, and coordination with Copernicus and the activities between Copernicus and, and Eurogeo. And also I would like to say that uh, perhaps uh, it would be nice uh, to have uh, a, a, a continuous communication uh, within uh, these uh, uh, sectors, like uh, it could be health, it could be energy, that go beyond uh, the you know, organization of these events, these workshops that are two, three times a year, of what happens in between, so what is the community doing in between. So uh, like having uh, uh, tools like perhaps uh, newsletters or, or blogs or you know, a way to keep the community informed about uh, maybe also changes in policies at the European level, you know, something that, that the, the community can engage in. Okay, thanks. Uh, from the room, any comment on, on this topic or if you have ideas or things you want to share on this? If not, I have a series of questions. I... Yes, Philippe? <laughs> so now I have a question. <laughs> I have a suggestion as well. So I pre agree that we should go beyond some uh, sparse events and to, to, to be more connected. And maybe uh, a way to be more connected is, uh, is to engage students, because we know that uh, students are um, interested, some engineering students. May, or PhD students may be very interesting in um, uh, contributing to the climate and energy uh, transition. And so uh, having coordination about students, the way they can move from an institution to another in the, in the network can, can help us to have a better relationship between us. So a bridge through the students, PhD and engineering students. Thanks. For, yes, Suzanne? Yeah, um, I also want to agree um, with uh, Miko. We need something what will finance longer time so that we, if, if we have some, some you know, products or some, some, some development that we can also use it for, for uh, extension for development. If you start with some, some grant uh, or basic research, then for sure you cannot do it in five years <laughs> to a final product. And um, the second thing what I think is also important that we might also have a look to, to other applications. So let's say from ter traffic or from health or what uh, he also said, that we have a look where energy applications is also used or needed. 
Yeah, thank you for the comment. Uh, and clearly, when you are looking to the uh, the spectral distribution of the solar energy, there are a full set of applications in agriculture, in health, also for the UV and so on. So I think there is also this uh, interlinkage with a different uh, type of uh, uh, thematic area yeah. that can support also the, the benefit of, uh, of your region. So if I, I, I saw also in the different presentation, um, Stelios was uh, acting uh, also uh, a bit on the action group. Uh, we have the Geovena initiative and there is also the Copernicus uh, Energy Hub, which is starting or growing. Uh, and so I, I have also a question about what are the complementarity, what are the, the place of each of these tools and how we can organize uh, their, their own activity on that. I think, Fabio, maybe you have an idea on that. Stelios also maybe. So, Fabio? I think it's to be to be thought and discussed. Uh, certainly, for instance, a representation of uh, um, Eurogeo in these thematic hubs uh, to, to guide and advise on how they can develop, uh, that, that, that I think it's very useful. Perhaps uh, the other way around as well. So from, from thematic hubs to Eurogeo, like we are doing now, uh, this morning and, and, and now, uh, presenting the progress with it. Uh, with GeoVenner, um, uh, yeah, I, I think what is probably important, interesting also for Europe uh, is to go outside of Europe and try to, you know, somehow also influence uh, development outside Europe. So this connection with GeoVenner uh, could be could be useful or any other, you know, uh, uh, initiatives uh, at, at, at global level. We have an example with Arctic Passion also, yes. Yeah. Yeah, but I would be very practical also on that thing that Fabio, in a way, talked about that, that the information, what is getting done where, I think we usually have to do blog posts or some kind of things. We can easily simply can release them in many channels. So like we can put them on the Energy Hub, they can be on the Arctic Passion side, they would be on the Arctic Geo side. And still it's the same news. I don't think it hurts at all that we we are practical in these terms and not try to, yeah, but this is ours and this is ours, because it's much more important that all of that information finds any route it can find to, to users. So, so I would start on that very basic level of communication, because then that actually makes you more day-to-day -day aware of the others. Uh, I think that's, that's a very useful thing, especially when something new comes up to, to integrate that. That is, I think, an important factor. Uh, but then at some point, it's probably good to, to do joint actions. Um, I have uh, actually actions in FP Cup with Chile, which are all energy related almost because the it's it's exactly the like PV production in Chile is interested for some things that we can do, and then it's uh, it's um, let's say uh, air quality related things which does have in the background that a lot of the energy production or, or things are bad there and and the air quality is so I think there are many links together where where. Comes, for example, is, is a useful tool in two directions and not just one. Um, we, we have been kind of like in, in helping them there to get things done. But I think this is, this is where all over the world, I think there is this opportunity that we are already giving them some basic data. But I have noticed from the Chile example, we actually are, are active in Africa as well and in other countries in South America, that, that there's still kind of like a certain step of being kind of like, like not uh, ready enough to just jump in and try and use things, but it's more like like that that they they want to build a trust relationship from this organized to the, the data through an organization or something to do together, and for that it will also be useful to kind of like uh, kind of share that what we are doing uh, between each other, but then it also helps to yeah, to bring those examples of where we are and then. Uh, it's very practical, some of these, so we had a hackathon there, so these are startup kind of things who would probably can have good partners in Europe to, to actually kind of develop their own thing, but maybe then also get, get a market somewhere else. Okay, thank you. Uh, Stelios, you want to add something on this? It's more... Uh, 
want to add some more organizational stuff and I, I copied something from another session that it talks about uh, this, how to achieve this joining this kind of actions. It uh, just says that uh, this other section uh, of the day in the morning addressing climate induced, induced disasters. There is a point that says that uh, designing future joint action, policy papers, publications, special edition and journals, workshops, webinars, information days for application and services, with support of the Euro Geo Secretary relevant C, uh, CSAs. I think it's a good uh, it's a good bullet to, to start with. I mean it probably is very general, but I would agree also with what Philip said about uh, including this educational aspect and students in this uh, kind of activity because it's uh, I think I think it's important. I agree with Philip on that. Okay. Thanks a lot. So maybe I, I, I have an additional question, um, which is uh, not very. Uh, so let's let's try it. Uh, so what are you waiting from Eurojo? No. Oh. <laughs> now you're looking at me or what? No, no, I'm looking to. to yeah, all please the look at the other <laughs> Suzanne, what are you waiting from Eurojo? Oh, good question. <laughs> I <have to> think about. <laughs> okay. Well, I think one simple thing is, of course, that how does Eurogeo, for example, help us to get funding to do some of these things? Mm -hmm. It's, I think, one of the very key questions. Like, Geo in Europe has always lived by the fact that there's actually some project funding available then to, to put those ideas into actions. We are definitely now on the thing that I find my money somewhere else, and if I'm nice enough, I come to Eurogeo with it. And if I don't care, I don't. So it, I think this is unfortunate, and I must say one of the things is Destination Earth, Copernicus could be both, and I'm, I'm actually involved in both of those, so it's also like bashing myself in a bit, but the, the fact that we could also be a little bit more kind of helpful to, to acknowledge that this thing is something that we should all work towards, so that, that when we do Copernicus actions, when we do Destination Earth actions, let's let's show those actions in the geo world as well. And I think the route is through Eurogeo. Uh, so the integration of action groups in Eurogeo with actions that we do in Copernicus, I think it's very natural that somehow these need to be connected and have, have kind of like, uh, yeah, meetings uh, a few times a year at least. But I think this is then that, that it should become something where each other uh, bring something and I think the geo part is to really how can we like inform the world of what happens in Europe because I, I'm also the geo principal of Finland so it is, was really horrible in Ghana when you are there and even all the data that we do is presented by the Americans as something that they call something else like uh, or the as Australians, even even worse. I think well, no, it's not worse. But in the, in fact, that they the they have yeah, but they, they, like they present things that is probably mostly sentinels, or it's even uh, reanalysis from ECMWF, and, and and then it's like all called just whatever Africa something. So they have several of these actions where they just rebrand it nicely as mm -hmm. Australia helps Africa or USA helps Africa, and then I'm like, wow, you're really kind of boring in the fact that you don't acknowledge and thank you Europe for the data because that's actually the case and that's why I think it is in that sense when we are doing for me at least from my point of view we do most of the first spearheading into new things for the whole world happens in Europe nowadays earth observation wise modeling wise everywhere and it's so stupid that we then don't use the geo world because it's not so easy in our world that we engage with Africans. We don't engage so much in other parts of the world. But Geo is the one where we could do this at least. And that, that would help to kind of like... Branding like, and, uh, yeah. and being uh, more uh, visible from the rest of yeah. the world. Uh, uh, as they would come Geo. to ask from us directly mm -hmm. and they wouldn't go to Australia to ask for help to use European data. Okay. And I like Australia, so no, no problem there. But in essence, just uh, this is a good example because so, they are so far away. That, that why not us be on the spot for this when we have mostly done it? Okay. Thank you for, for the comments. <laughs> Too so much, Fabio. Answer, I guess. Any, uh... 
Yes, I would say that uh, that this role of uh, EuroGeo to be an intermediary with the wider geo community is it's a, a very important one. Um, I would say that within Europe, probably the use of Copernicus data is, is well established. I mean, I, of course, you can you can do much more, but but uh, yeah, the, probably what is uh, uh, can be massively improved is the use outside of Europe, um, and possibly this could be stimulated also with some actions. Uh, I was talking before about the national collaboration program. Uh, that also helped uh, about the use of, uh, of uh, uh, Copernicus data in Europe. But I wonder whether there is a way to extend this concept outside Europe, especially in developing countries. Um, and whether, you know, there, there is a, a possible help with the, 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 part, the DG on uh, international partnerships. So, whether you know uh, Eurogeo could, could um, uh, mediate with the developing agencies uh, uh, in Europe uh, to support uh, the the use of uh, uh, Copernicus data for uh, development projects outside Europe. Thank you, Philippe Stelios. You want to add something on this? <clears throat> uh, yes, if you it's okay, yes, Stelios can go. Okay, so uh, I I see your as a uh, as many things because uh, it should be a network for us to work together. It should be also a, a community uh, to engage people to uh, to uh, to use Earth observation, and I think that there um, uh, should be uh, also a way to be connected to other networks. I am thinking for the for the. Or the domain of solar energy, for example, to be to use the Eurogeo to be connected to uh, PVPS, for example, uh, and to have this uh, connection. We can do it uh, individually, but it has a stronger effect if you we can uh, make this uh, uh, interrelation at the at the level of uh, Eurogeo, at least for uh, solar energy, for example. Uh, um, yes, so community and network, and uh, yes. Yes, and something about the funding of, of research and funding for uh, young researchers and students. Thank you. Stelios, you want to add? No, I don't have anything to add. So, uh, I have a full set of questions, but I think we are close to the end of this session. So I want to thank all the uh, the presenter about what uh, they present and all the discussion we have. But I think it's still continuing in the coming day, weeks, months, and so on. So thank you very much again. <laughs>